Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad on the Magic Brad Show, and I've got someone on, and he's got a book, and I want to find out more about it. His name is Anthony Ryan. You there, Anthony? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember before well, earlier I, I thought you were in Florida, but you're not. You're over on the west west side. You in the uh, I, I'm in the middle of uh, Sun Desert, Las Vegas. Uh, you can't get hotter than where I am. <laughs> you you like it out there? You know, Vegas is a great place. It um, you know, it, I, I was in I was in Los Angeles for a little bit. I was in Miami. I'm originally from Montreal, and I'll tell you, as far away as I can get from the snow, the better. So, being in Las Vegas, you can't get further away. Well, I'm up here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so I understand the Canadian snow. <laughs> there you go, exactly. We're neighbors. <laughs> How long have you been out there in Vegas then? You know, I've been out in Vegas for about four and a half uh, years now. Um, been in the United States for about six years. Okay. And I split up that time a little bit in Miami and didn't really feel like that was home and then moved out to Los Angeles and that didn't really feel like it was home. And when I came to Vegas, this really felt like it was where I, I wanted to be. So I built a house out here and, and moved my company out here. And uh, I've been here for about four and a half years now. Yeah, I got a brother that lives in Henderson out there and he loves it. Oh, Henderson. Well, he's not too far from me. <laughs> and there's a lot of event related stuff out there, you know, with all the convention centers and hotels out there in Las Vegas. Very interesting inexpensive to do an event out there because they want you to gamble and so everything else is fairly affordable and very cool uh, you know that, that that was really one of the reasons why i located myself out to vegas i was constantly down for the conventions and the events and a huge part of my business is uh buying up uh, retail buying up bankruptcies buying up samples and i was getting so tired of that trip between la and vegas i said you know there's no real point if I lived in Vegas, I wouldn't have to pick and choose which events I attended. I could just attend them all. So that was a huge decision part. That was a huge uh, part of my decision process when I decided to relocate out here. So is your business primarily like in real estate? So actually, my business is not really in real estate. You can call me a serial entrepreneur. Um, I started when I was 15 years old doing uh, e-commerce, and that slowly moved into buying at physical businesses and running those businesses and reselling those businesses. And then that sort of moved into buying assets from distressed businesses and then reselling those assets. So, uh, you know, over the years, my business has taken many different forms, but it really is uh, uh, the purchase and resale of distressed goods. And that could be, you know, uh, Pepsi calling me at two in the morning and saying, hey, Anthony, we have two trucks of, of Pepsi that's about to expire at midnight. Can you take it off our hands and do something with it? Or that could be something like Macy's calling me and saying, hey, we have 30 trucks of furniture sitting in our yard that we don't know what to do with. Do you think that you could take it off our hands if we give you an amazing deal? And then it's up to me really to say, okay, you know what? I can do something with this or I can't do something with this. And, um, you know, I'll give you a great example. Uh, Lockheed Martin hit me up. And, you know, when you're talking about Lockheed Martin, you're, you're talking about, a, you know, a really big industry. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, Anthony, we got, we bought a plant that manufactures planes. There is a landing gear department that uh, we don't want to deal with. Can you sell the equipment from that department? So, you know, it, it could be as big as Lockheed Martin, and it could be something as small as a mom and pop shop that decides to close up. I'm, you know, I'm dealing now with a dry cleaner that's closing in Miami. So uh, it could really be anything from small Almost to Almost kind of like a liquidation company or something like that. It, sort of. And you know what? I call myself a liquidator many times, and I call myself a problem solver. I've made a life off of dealing with other people's problems. So I had a friend... Uh you know, because my background's in the event business, which is part of it is trade shows. And where you're at out in Las Vegas, there's a lot of trade shows out there. So what he would do is he had made arrangements with a lot of the different conference centers down there, because oftentimes exhibitors go down there and they forget their displays. And Correct. it's, it's kind of like lost and found and then finders keepers, losers, weepers. He'd drive a truck down there and pick up all those displays for basically almost nothing. And then up here, he'd 
sell them to new exhibitors. <laughs> and that's, I, I've done that where I've stayed around to the ends of shows and made deals to take out, uh, you know, a large amount of merchandise. But I'll tell you after, you know, a, a four day show where you're on your feet for 15 hours a day, uh, sometimes you just feel like letting it go and not even bothering with it at the end. So, you know, each, each case is different. Especially nowadays with the, with the internet, I'm assuming you can spend some time online and find uh, really great deals on large things that you can- You know, uh, I, I, I have to actually say the opposite to that. And I, you know, I definitely don't want to contradict you in any way, but I actually feel like when a deal is on the internet, it's not a deal because there's millions of buyers out there watching that deal and looking at that deal. I feel like there are too many eyes on the online deals. I think that you have to traditionally be out on your legs, walking, shaking hands uh, to make those deals happen and to develop, uh, you know, future business and future business relationships. I think that when there's a deal online, there are too many people that jump on it. And in order to get a real deal, you need to be out there with a pile of cash in your hands and shaking hands at these conventions or wherever it is that you're, you're doing business. See, that makes a lot of sense. And you're not contradicting me. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you all these right. questions. And that right. makes a lot of yes, sense of now course. that you bring that up. That, that, I never really thought about that way. Uh, well, you have to, if I put a, uh, and this is a, an extreme example, but if I put a Ferrari on eBay for $10, okay, there are too many buyers to let that car go for under its market value. Nobody's going to let it go for a steal or a deal. Whereas if you meet somebody who, uh, you know, has this asset from a family member that might've left it, or they have it because who knows what reason you're able to strike a deal where you can, where you're in a better position to negotiate a price that's fair for you to be able to make a profit on it and still, uh, still uh, uh, come out ahead. Right. So without having 25 different buyers, they're trying to beat your price. So just the supply and demand. Element. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And there are just too many buyers online, especially during COVID. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. And uh, there are those places that do get, uh, I guess, like you say, saturated because people start finding out about it and they start sharing with other people and everybody knows all the little, the little secrets. Correct. One person so, sends a link to the next person and before you know it, you have a, a thousand buyers on one item. Yes. And it was a good deal and now it's not. Exactly. <laughs> correct. Yes. So is that part of you got a book, The Art of the Black Card. Right there. Got it. I'm looking at a got picture right of the real deal. Okay, I, cool. I got the real deal right in front of me. This is my book. It's called The Art of the Black Card, The No Bullshit Guide to Business. Um, that's my book. I just published it and came out. I believe it came out about three months ago. Um, what, so what's the essence of it? So the essence of it, I think that I, I was really tired of going online and seeing all these fake entrepreneurial guides and these, you know, on uh, self-proclaimed uh, business gurus. And um, a lot of these things that they were selling to people was, you know, buy my book, get become a millionaire in 30 days, buy my book and make <laughs> half a million dollars in 60 days. And I said, people need to know what the realities are of being an entrepreneur. And there was really nothing out there that said to people, Hey, you need to get off your ass every day and keep fighting no matter how bad it is out there. And I really took my own life experiences. I'm, I'm 38 years old now, and I started my first business when I was 15. I made my first million dollars by the age of 18. And I have had uh, uh, a lot of uh, trials and triumphs along the way. Um, I have found myself in financial trouble and I found myself on the other end of the spectrum where uh, I have so much money in my account, I don't know what to do with it that day. So I, I think that because of all that experience, I wanted to put that experience into a book and give people a realistic view as to what it is to be an entrepreneur. The reason that I called it uh, the art of the black card is at the age of 22, um, I, I was invited to the prestigious American Express uh, uh, Centurion Club, which is the Black American Express. And that felt like it was a huge uh, uh, success, a huge pinnacle in my life where I could say, you know what, I achieved something that so many people reach out to achieve. And I really wanted to tell people my story about how I achieved that, the hard work that it took to, 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 to get there and uh, put it in something that was a short, sweet, concise read uh, and easy to understand. 
Well, that's refreshing to hear that you got a book that's uh, like the real deal because you do see a lot of these people that are in like a, a network marketing company and they start saying my company when it's not really their company and they haven't even Correct. they haven't even got themselves an LLC or a incorporation of their company. They don't even have a company. They just invest into something and got a little kit. And exactly. They don't Correct. know what's really, or some of those guys that. Uh, you know, there's they're fairly illegitimate people doing this stuff where they do a video and say, you can make $15,000 in one week. Here's the proof. Oh, and it, it, you, you know, sick I mean, of it. Look, you, you can make $15,000 in a week, but it's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to happen on your first trial. I mean, you know, sometimes you're lucky and you come out with something and there are lucky. There's always exceptions to every rule. But I think I wrote a book that's going to really apply to every entrepreneur out there that really... Uh, uh, is going to be the average entrepreneur's experience. This is what he's really going through. This is what it's really going to take for him to succeed. And this is what he should expect if he goes down that path of uh, working for himself versus uh, being in the employment world. Sure. Um, I learned early on, my story is I started doing magic when I was a little kid and did it through grade school into high school. When I graduated, people said, get a job. So I got a job and I worked three years, got laid off and said, heck with that, I'm going to be my own boss. I just end up being a full-time magician. But when you're oh, doing wow. that, part of it is the performing. The other part is the marketing. And you've got Correct. to consistently, constantly market. You can't just go, well, it's Saturday. I think I'll sleep in until 11. No, you got to get up and get some work done, maybe on a weekend. You, know, you, you got to do, do I've, had, I've had deals where at midnight, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, a truck comes in. My employees don't get in. I you know who's there unloading the truck. I'm there unloading the truck. You know, and uh, that's just part of the business. It's part of working for yourself. You know, it's not a 9 to 5. It's a 24-7. And anybody that tells you otherwise, you know, I feel is leading you down the wrong path. I've had many uh, friends uh, come up to me and say, hey, I'd love to learn what you do. And after following me for 24 hours or 48 hours, they give up because they're like, hey, I thought you make money, you know, take buying something for $5, selling it for a million. And they don't realize the real work and effort that goes into doing what, uh, what I do to make a living. That's, that's a big piece of it, too, that if you've got that uh, you know, discipline to do that and you've got the passion and energy to do it, then you will get up and get it done because you do enjoy it. But like some people... I see this all the time. You got to work hard, got to work hard, you got to grind. But if a person doesn't have that in them to grind, they're not going to make it. So you got to, or you got to just really enjoy yourself. And, and you work. cannot, you cannot teach somebody uh, to be motivated. It's something that it has to be within them. You know, you, you can teach somebody theory, you can teach somebody tax code, you can teach somebody principle, but either they're an entrepreneur at heart or they're not. You cannot create one from nothing. Yeah, there's got to be something that's inside of them that inspires them to, to pull them through. There's, that's part of the reason that why thing. It's that why that'll pull you through and give you a reason to, to get up and go to work. And exactly. It can't be just the money either. It's got to be what the money Exactly. Does. No, and I, I always tell people, do what you enjoy, the money will come. And, you know, people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, I, I don't think I've ever sat down in my life in, in 20 years of doing this. I've never sat down and calculated how much I'm going to make uh, doing this deal or that deal or doing this and this. I just keep an influx of projects coming in and an influx of projects going out. And, you know, I might lose on, on one and I might make on 10. And, you know, I just know that it, that, that process brings in, you know, a salary that gives me a more than a comfortable lifestyle annually. Yeah, I think that is as far as business goes. It's a, I say you can't fail if you don't quit. So if you just keep on That's doing correct. it and you keep on That's swinging correct. the bat, eventually hit the ball, you know, as long as it's in the strike zone. Of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to a certain extent, of course, you know, and then, you know, there, there, there's, there's definitely people that they keep swinging the bat and unfortunately they should have given up a long time ago. Uh, that's for a whole different interview that we'll get into that. That's but the, you know, um, yeah. You I, I play a different game. <laughs> You might want to play a different game. You know, if baseball's not working out, try football, try soccer, try something else, you know, but uh, there are a lot of games out there. You got to find the game that you think you're going to be most successful at and keep putting the efforts in uh, uh, to, to make that happen. You know, you know with the, the stuff that you're doing, um, I talk a lot of times about like product market fit. Like if you've got, if you're selling like hamburgers and steaks and barbecue sauce, and you're targeting vegetarians and vegans, 
it's not going to work. So how Correct. do you go about, like, say you get a call, a big truckload of uh, widgets, how do you find a buyer for those widgets? Now that you got them, or do you, I suppose you got a big warehouse, you got to store all this stuff until someone wants it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that I, there's, so there, there, there's a few different things that I do. I will say that I have a very large eBay store. Um, people sometimes don't believe in They're like, oh, you do eBay. And I say, well, there is a lot of onesies and twosies and threesies that nobody's interested in buying from me. When you take over a company and a company is in bankruptcy, you get the retail goods, but you also get the president's desk. You get his book collection. You get everything that, that was in the secretary's drawers before she left. All that stuff is unsellable. And, I, you know, it, that sort of ends up on the online marketplaces. And I have a very large online marketplace to move those onesies and twosies. When it comes to very large amounts of goods, like as an example, I said Pepsi calling me at two in the morning and saying, hey, we have two truckloads of, of product that's about to expire. Can you take it for us? I don't want to warehouse that because there's a cost to truck that across the country. There's a cost to warehouse it and there's a cost to get it back out to the buyer. I'm better to work on a buyer and make a small profit and get it right to its destination. You know, I, after doing this for so many years, I pretty much know what's going to go where and who's going to buy what from me. I know that an expired food product is great for the, uh, 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 for Africa. Um, Africa does not care too much about the expiry date, so I can move a lot of that stuff there. Um, where there's other products, like if somebody calls me and they say, hey, we have a container of uh, hats and gloves for winter, I probably won't reach out to one of my buyers in California or Nevada, and I'll probably go back to some of my older contacts in Canada and right. say, hey, I have a container of gloves and hats. You know, um, Africa has no use for them. Do you have some use for them? So I think I think one, I've built up a large clientele over so many years. I know who to call for what. Um, I try not to warehouse the goods if I don't have to. The only things that I want to be warehousing are those goods that I'm going to get to the end user. And those are my e-commerce, you know, samples. Uh, uh, you won't believe how many samples get sent to me a year. And, you know, th those samples are fifty, a hundred thousand dollars extra in retail a year coming in. So it, you know, I, I try to really make sure that everything that comes in our doors ends up somewhere. So with this uh with the book and things, are you trying to teach people what it is you do or is the book more based on business in general and entrepreneurship in general? My my my, my book is definitely not based off of what I do. I uh, minimally talk about what I do for a living in the book. My book, first of all, I've owned probably 40 or 50 companies in my lifetime. Uh, I've owned everything I've owned from a UPS store. Um, I've bought franchises going bankrupt. I've ran them uh, prior to reselling them. Uh, one of my first businesses when I was 17 years old was a bistro, a little cafe with tables, and, uh, cooked some Italian food. Uh, uh, so I, I have a vast array of experience my book is really about being an entrepreneur and what it takes to be successful, the mindset and really how to realize opportunity where most people don't. I think that the greatest thing a reader is going to get from the book is they're going to start realizing opportunity where, uh, where they've never realized opportunity before. Um, I'll walk into a store as an example. I'll walk into, you know, uh, Home Depot. And Home Depot will be having a sale. My mind doesn't say, hey, you know, this is a great sale. I need some. My mind says, I wonder if it's cheap enough for me to buy the entire row and take it home and put it on my e-commerce store. I'm shipping 1,500 packages a week anyways. Doesn't change anything for me if I can take this product, add that to that, and ship back out. So I really teach people how to have that entrepreneurial mindset and how to have their eyes open to opportunity where they wouldn't realize opportunity before. And I do talk a lot about my failures in the book. And I think that people often don't talk enough about their failures. And I talk a lot about my failures and I talk about uh, people that have scammed me over the years, people have got a better deal on deals that I've done and how I've overcome those, uh, those uh, uh, trials and how I've come out on the other end ahead and how that's made me stronger as a person as an, as, and as an entrepreneur. Okay, well, before I get into how do we get a hold of you and learn more about it and how to get the book, 
I got course. sort of a side question, and uh, it's Go for it. not related to what you're doing at all, but with your experience, you probably have some input on it. And that's the uh, cryptocurrency world. What do you think oh. of that the whole Bitcoin electronic? That's a non tangible, you know? Well, I'll tell you uh, one thing. Um, so during the COVID crisis, I do live in Vegas. I do enjoy a night out at the casinos. And unfortunately, during COVID, when all the casinos were closed, I have had to turn to online gambling if I've wanted a bit of time down and a bit of time to play poker or relax or, you know, play something virtually and have a day off of work. And I've had to actually uh, get to know cryptocurrency a lot better than I did before because most of these online uh, uh, sites are using Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash um, to uh, to uh, uh, to buy in and, and buy out. Um, I will say that I, I think that uh, this is the future. I think the cryptocurrency is where the world is going. I think especially for entrepreneurs and especially for entrepreneurs who uh, want to have some sort of secure, uh, secure, tangible asset that they can really see and uh, uh, manage virtually that this is where it's going to be. Um, I think that Bitcoin, these sort of virtual uh, 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 currencies is the new gold standard. And I think that as we move into the next four, five, 10 years, I think that you're gonna start seeing banks get involved in this. And I think you're gonna see banks come out with their own virtual currencies. I know that I believe Amazon's working on their own virtual currency right now. I believe that there are a lot of other companies doing the same. And I think that this is sort of where the future lies um, is in this world. Yeah, see, that's right. I don't really, I, I think about it, but uh, like you said, it, the gold standard, but Amazon's got theirs and Bitcoin's got theirs and Ethereum's got theirs and Starbucks has their coffee cards and everybody's got Correct. their own little digital yes. currency. You wonder, is there going to be some kind of standard? And I think I, I was look look forward, and I think like Star Trek, Captain Kirk never had a wallet. Yes, he would exactly. Just go, to the, go to computer and say, "Computer burrito," and he gets a burrito. He's got lunch. I I, I think out. that. I, I think that the problem in uh, cryptocurrency is going to be with the IRS, and I think they're going to have the, pro the biggest problem and the biggest challenge is going to be with the IRS and government controlling this cryptocurrency because if I look at it now, um, there's a lot of potential uh, with cryptocurrency uh, to move large amounts of money and to, you know, have uh, 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 you know, hidden revenue streams. I don't think the problem is going to be with finding users. I think that as time goes, the user chip is going to grow and the user base is going to grow. I think the problem is going to exist into how government controls that, how the IRS gets involved, and uh, what sort of oversight exists um, to sort of manage this as we move into the future. Yeah, that is where it's kind of different. It's sort of like a, like a the people's money. You know, it's not going to be correct. Yeah, sort of a dark web kind of thing. It's kind of interesting. And I, I, and like like everything, I'm sure the government will find some way to get involved and control it. <laughs> well, you never know, you know, because there's some things like uh, people just come up with their own little play money kind of thing. You know, in in real life, they come up right. with their own little little transaction, bingo cards or whatever to to exchange goods. And uh, right. it's not taxable. It's like, you know, monopoly money or whatever. So well, I just we'll, had to we'll, ask we'll, that. We'll, we'll knock wood and hope that that doesn't happen. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Just, a, just an energy exchange. But I had to ask you that because you got Thank some you. business experience and it's, uh, it's, it's I'll, puzzling. I'll tell me. you that I'm starting to think of uh, cryptocurrency um, uh, as, 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 a very, as a very stable way to hold money in an unstable economy. Um, there's a gas station a block from where I live and they have a machine in there that you insert your cash into and it, you know, it will turn your cash into Bitcoin immediately and sends you the Bitcoin to your phone. And this is sort of cropping up everywhere. And there's a machine not too far from where I live that you can go with your phone, you know, dial into your Bitcoin, send it to the machine and the machine will pitch out some cash to you right away. So I think that the technology is growing. I think that there's a lot of companies uh, now working on how can we make this more user friendly? How can we turn it into cash? How can we take people's cash, turn it into Bitcoin? And I think that over the next few years, you're going to see this industry really grow. 
Yeah, it's just like uh, when you go on vacation, you got to convert your U.S. dollars into Jamaican dollars, and it's like correct. Some yes, other weird exactly. Crypto. <laughs> this is just another another way to convert it. <laughs> okay, so how do we get a hold of your book, and how do we get learn more about you? You got a web address and all that kind of stuff. How do we? So I'm I'm a little bit everywhere. You can follow me on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is ARTT Online, and now there's a double T in my art. I want to just. Uh, clarify that. So everything that I'm giving you is double T. So it's ARTT online for uh, my Instagram. It's ARTT online.com for my website. Uh, Facebook is ARTT online. Uh, we have, I do YouTube videos. I do a, try to put out a new YouTube video for entrepreneurs every uh, week. Uh, that as well, you can find my channel is ARTT online. Um, you will find my book on eBay and Amazon. You can find it both digitally on Amazon and paperback, or you can find it on eBay as a paperback uh, book. And all you have to do is search The Art of the Black Card uh, by Anthony Ryan, and that will come up uh, right away and you can buy it there. Well, very good. I appreciate you taking the time, Anthony. This has been very, uh, I mean, I'm 63 and I see people at a younger age and you kind of You've done more than I have, and I did it at twice as your age. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you having me on your show today. Um, you know, it's, it's people like you that really get uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, like me our word out there and help us, uh, you know, help other people. So uh, everybody has their little part that they do, and I appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you, Anthony. That's what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the can and beam it up to the universe and let people find it with keywords and and search engines and all that kind of stuff. So excellent. Thanks thank for you very the much time. for having me. I will uh, I'll get this off to you in about an hour. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Peace. Bye-bye.